America was made and continues to be made by those seeking a greater life. The Chinese, the Italians, the English, the French, the Japanese, the Germans, the African Americans, the Dutch, the Native Americans, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Scandinavians, the Indians, the Irish, the Russians, the Polish, the Arabians, the Peruvians, the Greeks, and the many others that have come from the many lands of this world. All of these great peoples continue to shape a country that breathes the air of ethnicity, not as individual cultures, but as one great culture, creating a great nation. This is America. With the original 13 colonies settling into their own and England and France feuding over control of the New World, the struggle for complete ownership of America was underway. What the powers in Europe didn't realize was that the ownership of America was not something that the colonists intended on relinquishing. This is a point that would become very clear as the colonists began their struggle for independence. the American Revolution. As is often the case in history, much more was at stake than the sum of its parts. Tea was dumped into the Boston Harbor. Lights were hung in a church steeple. Paul Revere rode around the countryside at midnight. The declaration was penned by Jefferson. A shot was heard round the world. Some battles were fought, and there was a rough winter at Valley Forge. Ultimately, George Washington defeated the British. But the result of these political and military victories took the 13 colonies and made them a nation whose ideals would forever influence the world. It would take decades of battles and thousands of casualties, but a nation's independence was to be won. America, the living dream Part two, the revolution in America. King Philip's War, despite what the name may suggest, was not the first in a series of wars with England. It was an attempt to oust white settlers from New England made by forces that came from the Wampanoag, Narragansett, Nipmuc, and Pocumtuck tribes. Led by the Wampanoag chief Metacomet, who became known as King Philip for his adoption of European customs and dress, they fought the English, who had waited for Metacomet's father, Massasoit, an old ally, to die before attempting to completely subjugate the New England Indians. The fighting occurred in the summer of 1676 and was the fiercest in the history of New England, bloodier even than some of the battles in the Revolution would be. The bands of Indians destroyed 12 of 90 Puritan towns while attacking 40 others, but the colonists had superior forces, including 500 Mohican gunmen, sworn blood rivals of the Wampanoag. In the most gruesome battle, the Great Swamp Massacre, 1,000 Indians were killed. This was the fate of King Philip, who was captured and murdered in August of 1676. His head was placed on a stick and displayed for all to see. As the colonists of New England learned from King Philip, the Indian problem was a very complex matter. All-out battles were quite dangerous, often costing thousands of lives. A solution came from the Dutch, the scalp bounty, which offered a fee for Indian scalps. While it's often thought that the Indians were the scalpers, it was the colonists who used this technique as a means of controlling the Indians. As was often the way with the Dutch, it even turned a profit. 
In the Bay Colony in 1703, 12 pounds sterling was paid for each scalp brought in. By 1722, this price inflated to 100 pounds. Even in Pennsylvania, the most progressive colony, scalps brought in a pretty penny. In an attempt to avoid a rebellion by the backwoods Paxton boys in 1763, Benjamin Franklin pushed the legislature of Pennsylvania to approve the bounty on Indian scalps. The American Revolution could be foreshadowed in another event that occurred in 1676 in Virginia. The somewhat overlooked event that became known as Nat Bacon's Rebellion would inspire nearly 20 other similar minor rebellions against colonial governments, including the aforementioned Paxton Uprising in Pennsylvania. A cousin to Sir Francis Bacon, the philosopher and scientist, he was an up-and-coming member of Virginia's ruling class. At the same time that the Puritans were doing battle with King Philip, Virginians were fighting with the Susquehannock due to a treaty broken by the English. Angered by the murder of his plantation overseer and what he considered too tame a policy that Virginia's Governor Berkeley held toward the Indians, Bacon organized a militia of 500 men and attacked the Indians. He became an immediate local hero when his group attacked the Okanichi, a peaceful tribe. Bacon criticized the governor for his unfair taxes, placing friends in office, and not protecting the Western farmers from the Indians in his Declaration of the People, which was published precisely 100 years before fellow Virginian Thomas Jefferson penned another declaration. Although branded a traitor by the governor, he did grant some of the reforms that Bacon had demanded, and he pardoned Bacon after a formal apology. Later, Bacon, outraged by the governor's not following through on his pledge to pursue the Indians, led troops of planters, servants, slaves, and other lower-class workers to Jamestown and burned it. Faced with this, the first popular rebellion in colonial America, Governor Berkeley fled, and an English naval squadron was sent in to capture Bacon. Although Nat Bacon died of dysentery before he could be captured, many of his militia were captured and wound up on the gallows. This and other uprisings, such as Leisler's Rebellion in New York in 1689 and the Regulator Rebellion in South Carolina in 1771, shattered the picture that many had of colonial harmony, setting the stage for the struggles of the have-nots to overcome the establishment. Another revolution that occurred in the mid-1700s from around 1730 to 1760 was the Great Awakening. This was a religious movement of fundamental Orthodox Protestantism that was created by two powerful and very charismatic evangelists, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. Born in America, it was as pastor of a church that Jonathan Edwards became famous for his fire and brimstone sermons, which caused hysteria in his listeners. As the colonies prospered, attention turned to slave trading, real estate, the rum business, and other earthly pursuits, and away from observing the Sabbath. Edwards responded to this, and in his most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, he likened sinners to a spider hung over a flame. When his popularity ended, Edwards became a missionary to the Indians and later was appointed president of Princeton, but died in 1758 before taking office. George Whitefield was an Anglican minister who received his training at Oxford and was influenced by Edwards. Much like Edwards, Whitefield was an orator whose status as such is legendary. Thousands would come to his outdoor meetings. He would chastise his listeners and then bring them back through the promise of salvation in his emotionally charged sermons. Benjamin Franklin, no model of piety himself, recognized Whitefield's ability to transform all who heard him. But the influence that Edwards and Whitefield had went far beyond religion. Their dedicated followers included the poor, blacks, and women. 
many of whom were excluded from the established churches of the day. The split created between the classes by the awakening also encouraged the founding of several new colleges which included Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, and Rutgers. The emphasis on avoiding sin and personal improvement also helped give birth to the many reform movements of the 1800s like temperance, public education, abolition, and moral reform, to name a few. And this new religious force began the loosening of the tie between church and state, a spirit that would become embedded in the Constitution. The death of George Whitefield moved one follower, 17-year-old Phyllis Wheatley, a black slave who became one of America's first poets to write of him, Thou didst in strains of eloquence refined inflame the soul and captivate the mind. The New York Weekly Journal was founded in 1732 by a wealthy landowner named Lewis Morris, and like several other publications before and since, the journal used techniques that had already become an American tradition. Reporting the news, well, not really. Mud slinging and axe grinding worked much better for the journal. Better, that was, until the target became New York Governor William Cosby and his allies. While the governor was good enough to overlook the front page polemic on the right of the people to be critical of their rulers, it was the back page advertisements that angered him. The advertisements, as they were called, were more like slightly masked attacks on the governor that likened him to a monkey and his supporters to spaniels. Despite the fact that he had no control over the editorials, the editor, John Peter Zenger, a German-born printer, was charged with seditious libel and placed in jail for 10 months. At Zenger's trial, his attorney, Andrew Hamilton, a Philadelphia lawyer, made an argument that the articles in question were true and therefore weren't libelous. Although he was ruled out of order, Hamilton swayed the jury and Zenger was acquitted. Hamilton praised the jury's verdict, saying, You have laid a noble foundation for securing ourselves that to which nature and the laws of our country has given us a right, the liberty both of exposing and opposing arbitrary power by speaking and writing truth. This was the first landmark in the tradition of free press which would some 40 years later become law as it was written into the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights. Politically, this freedom would be used in the war of words that set the revolution in motion. The French and Indian War, unlike what the title suggests, was not a case of the French battling against the Indians. It was instead a war between England and the French and their Indian allies from 1756 to 1763, which was also known as the Seven Years' War. The conflict began when a 22-year-old planter's son was sent to the backwoods of Pennsylvania in 1753 to tell the French that they were trespassing on territory that belonged to Virginia. The French corrected the young Virginian, informing him that it was their intent to take Ohio. Upon returning, the young man, who had no military experience, was made a lieutenant colonel and given command of a militia force of 150 men. He returned to battle the French and found they were occupying a fort on the site of Pittsburgh called Duquesne. Although badly outnumbered, the young commander fired on the French, constructed a fort which was appropriately named Necessity, and even took prisoners. But he was eventually forced to surrender 
and sent back to Virginia by the French, where he was hailed a hero for battling so courageously against sworn enemies of England. However, it would take quite some time for the English's luck to change for the better. Despite the fact that there were over 1.5 million English in America compared to 90,000 French, the English found themselves taking on better organized fighters who were more experienced and had more Indian allies. After all, the French posed a smaller threat to the Indians. There were far less of them than there were English, and the French were more interested in trading for beaver pelts than pushing them off of the land. Seen as an opportunity to repay the English for their poor treatment, the Indians fought savagely, as did the English, who offered their Indian allies five pounds sterling for the scalp of a French soldier, 100 pounds for that of a Jesuit missionary scalp, and 200 pounds for the scalp of the powerful Delaware chieftain, Shingas. In 1755, General Braddock commanded 1,400 English soldiers to march on Fort Duquesne. A much smaller force of French soldiers subsequently massacred the English. Among them, General Braddock was killed. Instead of being given a proper grave, he was buried in a roadbed by his men, who proceeded to run wagons over his dusty grave. Their reason for such an unusual grave? So that the Indians would not find and mutilate the general's body. Braddock's last order to his aide-de-camp had the aide go for reinforcements nine miles away. When he returned, Braddock had died. The young aide, who had spent most of the battle stretched out in the back of a wagon due to illness, had only spent 24 hours defending the colonies and was given a unique offer by the French. Having surrounded his fort, the French offered the colonists the chance to march out if they promised to not return. The aide a young soldier by the name of George Washington led his men out with their guns and their honor. This battle between the English and the French was linked to a larger, more global clash that began in 1756. Things finally turned around for the English in 1758 when William Pitt took over the war effort, concentrating on naval warfare. Tactics such as negotiating with attacking Indians by giving them blankets from the smallpox hospital were also employed. Numerous victories from 1758 to 1760 gave the English control of the American colonies. The fall of Montreal in 1760 extended their territory to all of Canada. Finally, in 1763, the Treaty of Paris brought peace and secured complete victory for the English. In the aftermath of the French and Indian War, England was left with an enormous wartime debt to pay. It was the belief of the rulers in London that the colonies should pay for a portion of the costs of defending America, as well as the yearly costs of administering the colonies. The result came to be known as the Sugar Act of 1764, which was levied by Parliament and placed tariffs on sugar, coffee, wines, and other products that were imported into America in large quantities. Suffering from a post-war depression, this act hit American merchants and consumers quite hard. It was this that also inspired James Otis, a vocal radical leader from Massachusetts, to pen one of the most famous and inspiring slogans from the revolution, no taxation without representation. The colonists while outraged by the lack of political influence they had, did have the wisdom to know that even if they were granted a handful of seats in Parliament, it still wouldn't amount to a political pile of coffee beans. What it did point out to the American politicians, though, was that a wedge was being driven deeper and deeper between Mother England and her colony. Any sort of real resistance to the Sugar Act did not materialize, and the colonists began to accept the tax. And it was accepted, until Parliament, who was given an inch, tried to take a mile. The Stamp Act of 1765 placed rigid tariffs on almost every type of printed matter, be it a newspaper, a legal document, or even a pack of playing cards. 
While the Sugar Act reflected Parliament's ability to tax trade, the Stamp Act was different. It wrecked something which placed a thorn in the side of colonial America. Protests from America were now very clear and grew violent as rioting broke out. In Boston, an angry mob destroyed the house of Governor Thomas Hutchinson. In New York, the home of the officer in charge of the stamps was ransacked. A boycott of the stamps was followed by a general boycott of English goods. Hard hit by the colonists' tactics, merchants in London pleaded with Parliament, and the law was repealed in 1766. One member of Parliament opposed to the act coined the phrase Sons of Liberty in describing the headstrong colonists, a term that was very quickly adopted by the men in every colony. It was this act that would inspire American forces to begin gathering right under England's nose. Apparently, England did not get the message of the Stamp Act boycott, as in 1767, Parliament levied a new set of incendiary taxes called the Townsend Acts. And once again, the colonists, true to their Sons of Liberty nickname, organized a boycott that cut imports from England in half. Acting as many superpowers do, the British responded to the Americans' protest by sending in troops. Very quickly, 4,000 British soldiers arrived in Boston, which was already a hotbed of political unrest, and a city of 16,000 that was hard-pressed for jobs. The troops did not just sit idly by and play watchdog over the colony. The British soldiers competed for jobs with laborers on Boston's waterfront in early March of 1770. Fights often broke out between citizens and soldiers and came to a head on March 5th when a mob of hard-drinking waterfront workers confronted a detachment of nine British soldiers. The mob threw snow and ice mixed with rocks at the soldiers. The mob began to yell for their blood, and the soldiers became understandably nervous. Someone, most likely from the crowd that had gathered, yelled, fire, and the soldiers shot. Five bodies fell to the ground, including Crispus Attucks, who was the first to die. A black, or perhaps Indian mulatto sailor, he would become what many consider the first casualty of the American Revolution. Labeled the Boston Massacre by propagandists, among them Samuel Adams, those killed had become martyrs, as two-thirds of Boston marched along at their funeral procession. The British troops were quickly withdrawn from Boston. Ironically, the Townsend Acts were repealed on the day of the massacre. A period of relative calm followed the massacre, that was until 1773, when Parliament granted a legal monopoly on tea shipment to America to the nearly bankrupt East India Company. Adding insult to injury, only selected loyalist merchants, such as the son of the governor of Massachusetts, were allowed to do tea business. The colonists feared what the British might try to control next. In November 1773, three cargo ships filled to the brim with tea sailed into the Boston Harbor. Samuel Adams and John Hancock led the patriots in a vow that the tea would not be landed. The governor fought hard on this as his son stood to gain from the landing of the tea. On the night of December 16, 1773, 150 men from all parts of Boston's economy darkened their faces with burnt cork, dressed as Mohawk Indians, and boarded the three ships. In the course of over three hours, they dumped all the tea from the ships into the harbor. In fact, so much tea had dumped that it piled up in the waters and spilled back up onto the deck. The Boston Tea Party was the definitive turning point in the struggle for independence, as it moved King George to say, the die is now cast. The colonies must either submit or triumph. Parliament 
reacting to the Tea Party, passed a series of bills called the Coercive Acts, the first of which, the Port Bill, was aimed at shutting down Boston until the tea was paid for. In response to these and other intolerable acts, as the colonists referred to them, the first Continental Congress was formed. Fifty-six delegates from every colony but Georgia met in Philadelphia from September 5th to October 26th, 1774. Despite the presence of both moderates and conservatives, John Adams privately worried that we have not men fit for the times, we are deficient in genius, in education, in travel, in fortune, in everything. But that seemed not to be the case, as they adopted a resolution responding to the coercive acts, organized a boycott of British goods, and passed 10 resolutions enumerating the rights of the colonists and their assemblies. They arranged for a second session if necessary, and although they did not declare independence, the revolution had begun. All that was needed was the first shot to be fired. Late on the night of April 18, 1775, Paul Revere, after seeing two lanterns in the belfry of the Christ Church in Boston signaling a British attack by sea, rode with Billy Dawes to warn Lexington of the British advance. Joined by Samuel Prescott, they continued on toward Concord, though only Prescott escaped a British patrol and reached Concord. In Lexington and Concord, fighting had resulted in bloodshed, and when the Second Continental Congress met on May 10, 1775, they knew what had to be done. To solidify the only unsure delegates from the South, a delegate from Virginia was made commander of the new Continental Army. And on June 15, 1775, George Washington, donning his old military uniform, received that appointment. At the Battle of Saratoga, the British general, Simon Fraser, heard a weird turkey gobble as he led his corps near the woods of Freeman's farm. Every officer that advanced was picked off by an unseen shooter. American commander Daniel Morgan had his men fire their frontiersmen's rifles from 300 yards. Morgan used the turkey gobble to signal orders to his men. Also at the Battle of Saratoga, Benedict Arnold was second in command to General Horatio Gates, whom he disliked. In disagreement with his tactics, Arnold's request to be relieved of his command was granted. But when battle broke out soon after, Arnold cried, no man shall keep me in my tent today, and raced off into battle. He received an injury when his horse was shot and fell on his leg, leaving Arnold with a permanent limp. And although Arnold's charge was considered the decisive factor in the battle in the eyes of the defeated British commander, General Burgoyne, it was ignored by the American commander. Instead, Gates charged Arnold with disobeying orders and made no mention of his heroics when reporting the great victory to Congress. At another point, a British force headed down the Mohawk Valley toward Albany with 1,000 Iroquois Indians. Benedict Arnold, the American in charge of fending them off was badly outnumbered, but had an idea. He had access to a madman. The Indians believed that an insane Tory named Han Yost Schuyler spoke with the voice of the Great Spirit. Arnold held Schuyler's brother captive, and through threats, he got Schuyler to tell the Indians that an overwhelming force was approaching. Mysteriously, the British found that their Iroquois allies had disappeared in the night, and Arnold was able to turn back the invasion without firing a shot. Earlier, before the war had officially begun, Benedict Arnold decided to attack the British fort at Ticonderoga. At about the same time, Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys got the same idea, and the two met unexpectedly on the way to the fort, and immediately there was an argument as to who was in charge, 
While Arnold hadn't raised any troops yet, he did have written authority from Massachusetts and a new uniform. Allen had his unruly Green Mountain boys. After a shouting match filled with threats, the two finally calmed down enough to launch a joint attack. Although they approached the fort side by side, when they got close, Arnold and Allen began to race each other. Despite their almost comic behavior, they succeeded in a bloodless capture since the British force had no idea they were coming. Allen's lasting fame for this event is due to the fact that he put his experiences in a book. In it, he found it easy to solve the problem of command. He simply did not mention Arnold. When it came time to sign the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776, not everyone was as enthusiastic as John Hancock was about signing the legendary document. Delegate Dr. Benjamin Rush wrote of the pensive and awful silence which pervaded the house when we were called up one after another to the table of the President of the Congress to subscribe what was believed by many at that time to be our own death warrants. The richest man in America, Delegate Charles Carroll, also agreed with Rush. Not wanting anyone else to suffer harassment for his actions, he signed Charles Carroll of Carrollton. There just happened to be quite a few Carrolls in Maryland and more than one with the first name Charles. Carroll was the only delegate to add an identifying phrase the only Catholic to sign, and the last of the signers to die in 1832 at the ripe old age of 95. Benjamin Franklin, who at the signing of the Declaration said, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly we shall all hang separately, was one of the most fascinating men of the Revolution, a printer, writer, philosopher, scientist, politician, and diplomat, he was one of the most famous men in the world. He started a newspaper, founded the first American subscription library, became clerk to the Pennsylvania legislature, established the first fire company, became postmaster of Philadelphia, established the American Philosophical Society, and launched Poor Richard's Almanac, and proved that lightning and electricity were the same force of nature. He seemed to find success wherever he went, everywhere that was, except with his family. Franklin and his illegitimate son, William, who had helped him with the famous kite experiment, were close before the revolution came, and Franklin even used his influence to get his son appointed governor of New Jersey. But when the war came, William sided with the British and caused his father much pain. Franklin wrote of it, indeed, Nothing has ever hurt me so much as to find myself deserted in my old age by my only son. When King George III needed troops to battle the rebellion in his colonies, he turned to German princes who were happy to rent out their armies. The price? Well, for every German soldier killed, the prince got an extra seven pounds, four shillings, and four and a half pence. Three wounded soldiers also counted as one killed soldier. King George also turned to the German state of Hanover, which he happened to rule. Subsequently, he made an arrangement where he actually hired out those troops to himself. In explaining himself, he said, I do not mean to make one sixpence by this. While George Washington prepared to cross the Delaware River on Christmas night in 1776, the Hessian commander at Trenton, Colonel Rawl, was drinking Applejack and playing cards. When he received a note from a British loyalist that warned of the impending American attack, Rawl just placed it in his pocket 
After all, it was late, he was groggy, and the note was in English, so Rawl couldn't read it, even if he wanted. Washington attacked at dawn and took 1,000 prisoners in his much-needed victory. Rawl, who was wounded in the battle, lay dying as the note was found in his pocket and translated. Had he read it earlier, Rawl admitted, I would not be here. Mary Hayes was wife to a gunner in the 1st Pennsylvania Artillery and followed her husband to the Army's winter camp at Valley Forge, where she pitched in by doing the wash and cooking. The next summer, she marched with the Army at the Battle of Monmouth on June 28, in 1778. When the temperature got up to 100 degrees, she brought water from a nearby spring amid cries from the soldiers, Molly, the pitcher! When her husband dropped from heat stroke, Molly Pitcher, as she was nicknamed, took her husband's place at a cannon. She smoked a pipe, chewed tobacco, swore like a sailor, and in 1822, the Pennsylvania State Legislature granted Molly Pitcher a yearly pension of $40, which, considering the monthly salary of a soldier was $6.66, wasn't that unfair after all. In the middle of the winter of 1778, George Rogers Clark led a raid on Vincennes with only 130 men. They marched 200 miles, including wading for miles through ice-cold water, and arrived at the fort entrenched by the British. Knowing he was outnumbered, Clark applied boldness and a bluff. Approaching from behind a low range of hills at dusk, which allowed his troops to be hidden while they marched with two dozen flags and banners, giving the impression of a much larger army. The flags were flown from extra long poles and were used repeatedly as the men marched around and around the same hillock. Once dark, Clark finally led his men near the fort, shelling in pauses to give the appearance of reinforcements. After several days, the British Colonel Hamilton was intimidated into surrendering. When captured by the Americans, Hamilton asked, Colonel Clark, where is your army? And when he realized the truth, Hamilton turned away with tears in his eyes. But the treatment of German and British officers who were taken prisoner was for the most part civilized, sometimes very much so, as was the case at Monticello in 1779, where prisoners of war commonly dined with Thomas Jefferson, who loved their spirited conversation and their music. American officers encamped at New Windsor, New York, awaiting the peace treaty that would end the Revolutionary War, were not always treated as well. Angered by lack of payment and the ineptness of the Continental Congress, the threat of a military coup was real. In an attempt to change their minds, Washington gathered his officers together and delivered a speech that did nothing to change their minds. It was only when Washington attempted to read them a letter and then stopped to fumble for his glasses, uttering, Gentlemen, I have grown gray in your service and now I'm going blind, that the coup was averted, as some officers were actually moved to tears. And on September 3, 1783, the Treaty of Paris ended the Revolutionary War, giving the colonists their independence. Using their determination and intelligence, the ragtag American army defeated the British Empire, letting nothing stop them as their momentum grew even in defeat. Aided by the French, who perhaps wanted to get back at England for the Seven Years' War, American independence was an idea whose time had come, a historical inevitability that gave birth to a nation that was now recognized as its own country. Now it was time for the Founding Fathers to live their dream and devise a system to govern themselves into the next century 
and beyond. Thomas Jefferson's influence on the growth of artistic America was second only to his influence on politics. He was one of the leading architects of his time, credited with the introduction of the neoclassical style into America. He felt that its echoes of glory suited the ideals of his new country. It would take decades of battles and thousands of casualties, but a nation's independence was to be won. Aaron Burr was vice president of the United States when he challenged former Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton to a duel. Hamilton had defamed Burr by using such words as despicable. And although he was opposed to dueling, as it had cost his only son his life, Hamilton agreed to duel at the very same spot that his son died. At sunrise on Wednesday, July 11, 1804, Burr and Hamilton went from New York City across the Hudson to New Jersey. They walked 10 paces, then fired. Burr evaded the bullet while Hamilton was shot in the groin and died an agonizing death. The vice president then went into hiding, re-emerging after four months. Though he was still wanted for murder in New Jersey, he was never prosecuted. After losing the presidency in 1824 to John Quincy Adams in an election that had gone to the House and in which Adams offered the Speaker of the House a cabinet position, striking what Andrew Jackson called a corrupt bargain, Jackson was finally elected president in 1828. And for the first time, there was neither an Adams nor a Virginian in office. Jacksonian democracy offered a grassroots approach 
from a frontiersman who embodied the new American spirit, although the political process was still fairly exclusive and Jackson was described by some as both militant and greedy. And although the spoils system of rewarding friends with political positions is often linked to Jackson, only a few new patronage jobs were created during his years. Frederick Bailey, a slave, hopped a train out of Baltimore in 1838, hoping that the fact he was dressed as a sailor would disguise him. He carried borrowed papers and money given to him by a free black woman, Anna Murray, who would become his future wife as he traveled along the Underground Railroad, which was neither underground nor a railroad, but instead a secret passageway for slaves to escape. Once north, he changed his last name from Bailey to Douglas. While the safe route would have been to live quietly, Frederick Douglass found it necessary to speak up against the grave injustice of slavery. His protests, which he based on his own beatings and humiliations as a slave, made him a national figure. Since skeptics doubted the slave could be so eloquent, Douglass published his autobiography under the name of his master. His friends feared for his safety, so he went to England. It was there that approximately $700 was raised to buy his freedom a liberty that came eight years after 